Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Dialogue. I'm Tamur Shamil. Yesterday, Pakistan, China, Russia and United States met in Moscow to discuss the uh, peace and the peace process in Afghanistan. It's been 19 years now since the U.S. and the United forces have been fighting uh, this war on terror that they call in Afghanistan. Uh, many people are of the view that this peace deal that they talk about, generally the peace deal that we talk about in Afghanistan, is perhaps more about a withdrawal deal. Because when we talk about peace, perhaps the prospects of peace have never been there actually for the people of Afghanistan. This 18-year-long war, which has entered in its 19 year, by the way, uh, has been a long one, as I just mentioned. But what is going to be the end of this war? What is going to be the political solution of this war? Would the uh, Taliban agree with the Kabul government, with the new Kabul government that would be coming in after these elections? Would the Kabul government and Taliban share uh, power in Afghanistan? Would that happen? What would be the political scenario once the U.S. withdraws its troops from, Af uh, from Afghanistan? Or would they? Would they even draw, withdraw their troops? Because there are reports that the U.S. is quietly withdrawing its troops from Afghanistan and they are moving now towards uh, the peace process, I just, as I just mentioned. Yesterday was a meeting between four countries talking about peace and stability. We'll talk about that in today's program and also about Syria. Uh, Russia and Turkey are now uh, collaborating on uh, securing uh, the safe zone, let's say, for Turkey, that Turkey calls their safe zone in the uh, Syrian, around the Syrian border. These wars in Syria and Afghanistan are not just, I would say, one war. The Afghan war is not just one war. There are many wars within Afghanistan at many levels. Same goes for Syria. There are many wars within Syria uh, from different angles. You talk about the Bashar al-Assad regime, you talk about United States, Turkey, uh, Russia for that matter. All these countries certainly have their own stakes. And when there is a void, somebody has to fill in the void. And we are looking at it right now at the moment. Uh, we are going to discuss about the war in Afghanistan, the peace process that we talked about yesterday uh, that was there in Moscow, and also the war in Syria. Uh, these two wars with our special guests in the studios. Our first guest is Ambassador Khalid Khatak, renowned senior diplomat and expert on Pakistan's foreign policy and international relations. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Our second guest is Mr. Ahmed Zaki. He is a lecturer in uh, political science and also an expert on Middle Eastern affairs as well as the war in Afghanistan. Welcome to the show, Mr. Zaki. Thank you for having me. <coughs> Mr. Khatak, starting with Afghanistan first. Uh, yesterday was this meeting of uh, four countries, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Russia, China, Pakistan and United States. They discussed the peace process in Afghanistan. Now, talking about the peace process, and we have been discussing this thing for a long time now, many people see this thing at the moment as more sort of a withdrawal deal instead of a peace deal. What's your take on yesterday's meeting between these four countries? And what's your take on the peace deal and the withdrawal deal? These two points. Well, thank you. And your comment, you spoke about uh, Afghanistan problem being discussed in Moscow and then Turkey, Russia, collaboration in creating this uh, safe zone yes. in Syria. What's the common between the two? Daesh. The possibility of the re-emergence of Daesh. Uh, Farid Zakria, in one of his interviews some years ago, asked Netanyahu, who was then the Prime Minister of uh, uh, Israel, that what was the strength of Daesh? And Netanyahu's reply was that the idea to redeem history, a powerful idea. And then he mumbled that, think of it, our strength is also in that idea. So it is uh, that factor, the re-emergence of uh, Daesh and organizations like Al-Qaeda, both in Syria and in Afghanistan, that actually has, in a way, accelerated this process of uh, withdrawal of the U.S. troops uh, from Afghanistan. Now, when it comes to the withdrawal of the U.S. troops in Afghanistan, this is qualitatively different from 
uh, they are withdrawn from uh, border with the Turkey or what they call it, Kurdistan. In Afghanistan, this withdrawal is taking place as a result of a demand of Taliban. It has been a long-standing demand of Taliban that so long foreign forces stay in Afghanistan, there, were, there was not going to be any peace in Afghanistan. Uh, Zalmay Khalil Zad's you see, uh, diplomacy uh, aimed at achieving two things. First, it was to, you see, dilute of one position that, well, the majority of the American forces would leave Afghanistan, but some troops would continue to stay in Afghanistan. And secondly, that during the negotiations, there would be ceasefire. Uh, and this is how these Doha talks and right. been, uh, been going many on. rounds of it took place, and including during his visit to Pakistan and uh, right. meeting with Taliban in the U.S. Embassy, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. In Islamabad, right. But that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. Now, when it comes to Russia, Russia has deep interest in stability in Afghanistan, and again, particularly because of the Daesh factor and the Islamic terrorism factor, you know. Uh, uh, Russia and America both, in a way, can be called the original sinners, mm -hmm. what they call it, you know, in the biblical right, language, yes, yes. that the original sin. Mm -hmm. uh, and <clears throat> both have, in a way, learned their lessons. America is still uh, learning. Russia has learned its lesson, but Russians have a first-hand experience of uh, Afghanistan. The gentleman who deals with Afghanistan in uh, Russia is Zamir Kabulov, uh, who had been Russian ambassador in Afghanistan, who, ha who has been a second, who has been head of the second Asia division in uh, Moscow, and who is currently President Putin's representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Similarly, Zalmay Khalilzad and these other people, they are also, you know, tried hands, and Zalmay Khalilzad himself right, belongs right. to, you know, the, to, to, to Afghanistan. Now, I personally feel, you know, that uh, with Pakistan and China, now China would take part of the reconstruction part, right. or what we call it nation building, in which Americans have time and again failed everywhere. Uh, okay, and Pakistan will contribute to, Pakistan and Russia would contribute to the stability factor. So there will be a kind, some kind of a division of labor also, yeah. which would take <clears throat> place. So this is very interesting point, Mr. Zaki, this, this division of strategic interest, let's say, as Ambassador Khattak just mentioned, and the economic angle of, of Afghanistan, because the United States has been very clear about this, especially uh, US President uh, Trump that they are not interested in the initial bending in Afghanistan, of course, withdrawing troops from there and end this war in Afghanistan. This, but once this war ends, let's say, or there is this withdrawal of U.S. troops which is going on, uh, there would be big threats. Daesh would be one. But another big, perhaps, challenge would be the political landscape that is going to be in the future. How the different power elites are going to share power in Afghanistan. How do you see that? In, in Afghanistan, <coughs> there are a lot of interest groups inside Afghanistan. Uh, and in Taliban, there are a lot of groups combined inside Taliban itself. Taliban who want to construction or build in a peace process are the front leaders or the majority of the Taliban is now they are ready to have a peace negotiation with America. The question is that are they going to uh, are they going to accommodate with the other uh, functionists, mm -hmm. rivalists inside Afghanistan, mm -hmm. including the Afghanistan government, legitimate Afghanistan yeah. government? Taliban still didn't recognize the Afghanistan government. Mm -hmm. They didn't still negotiate directly to the Afgan Afghanistan government. The question is that they are saying they are puppet government mm -hmm. under the hand of the Americans, right. and we are going to negotiate with their 
uh, safeguard uh, their protectors, not by them. Right. So if the peace process successfully done by the Moscow, by the intervention of Moscow now, the negotiation will change. Mm -hmm. If the peace process conclude that, Taliban should have to give a guarantee that after withdrawal of the American forces or foreign forces, there should have to be a political, a political settlement with the other Afghan functionist groups in right. peaceful manner, not by forcing them by their own ideology to implement the rest of the country. Right. See, as Ambassador Khalid now mentioned, that ISIS is also one of the issues. Mm. ISIS uh, or Daesh, whatever you call, mm. they have extensive network not only in, in Afghanistan, but also in Syria. But, but Syria was a little different. Syria is different from, of course, very different from Afghanistan. In mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Ambassador Khatak, we have Taliban who have been fighting against the US, against the NATO forces, these big, powerful armies. Mm -hmm. What is Daesh for the Taliban? Because some people think that Taliban can take care of Daesh. But the bigger issue is the political settlement in Afghanistan. Because my, I would just put it simply. Would there be peace after the withdrawal of the U.S. troops? Well, diplomats are not in the business of uh, predictions, and uh, it's difficult to predict, you see, whether there will be peace and when it will be peace and what kind of peace it will be. <clears throat> but the realities on the ground suggest three things. Daesh is the product of the American intervention and American occupation of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Taliban and the civil war that ensued. Mm. Taliban are the product of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and the civil war that ensued. Mm. So to this extent, mm. there's something in common. Daesh stands for an international and a global ideology. Mm. Taliban are a mix of Pashtun orthodoxy and you know, local religious outlook influenced by the Pashtun orthodoxy. Right. Taliban are not for globalist organization or right. something. The issue in Afghanistan uh, unfortunately remains the same as it was uh, after the overthrow of Daoud. Distribution of power between the Pashtun and the non-Pashtun groups. You know, and the fact that Afghanistan continues to be an overly centralized uh, government and it's not willing to have a, some kind of a federal or confederal you know, relations, where you see such a distribution between the non-Pashtuns and non-Pashtuns would become easier, right. you know, uh, is also part of the problem. The s second part of the problem in Afghanistan is that while, you know, uh, Russia has written off, you see, all the assistance in it, so to the range of $1.5 billion uh, that was given to Afghanistan during its uh, occupation. You know, how the Afghans are going to handle the uh, economic Economy, situation yes. after the American withdrawal, withdrawal, because the American taxpayer is not going to pay any more and in the same quantity for the Afghan reconstruction. Of course, and I think that's the main idea, that they are withdrawing the troops yeah. from there, because that is the end of it. That's all that they are going to. We have Mr. Hassan Khan, renowned senior journalist and an expert on Afghanistan with us on phone call. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Mr. Hassan Khan, uh, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we are discussing Afghanistan. As you know, that uh, yesterday, the four countries, Pakistan, Russia, China, and the United States met in Moscow. And they discussed about the uh, peace, and st peace and stability in Afghanistan, the peace process in Afghanistan, also that the violence should end. Uh, we are discussing this in the, in the show. Uh, my question to you is that what would be the scenario after the uh, uh, withdrawal of the U.S. troops? Because that has already started. Do you see peace after the U.S.? Because that is the biggest question, the political landscape in Afghanistan. How do you see it? Uh, I think this uh, uh, first, uh, this uh, hypothetical uh, question that uh, in case the U.S. troops uh, will withdraw, so uh, in the current situation, if you go uh, that, that we keep it constant, what's going on in Afghanistan at the moment, 
And then we say the situation, uh, what will be the situation when the U.S. forces withdrew from Afghanistan? So I think first, uh, I don't see that uh, the U.S. will uh, commit that blunder. Are either the regional important countries, including Pakistan, will allow the U.S. Uh, to, to withdraw from Afghanistan uh, without having a uh, proper setup, uh, proper arrangement there. And in that case, uh, and in that case, uh, God forbid, uh, if there is no peace arrangement uh, between the warring, uh, the, the, the warring faction, including the Afghan government and the, and, and the Taliban, and the U.S. withdrew. So I think that will be a nightmare, not for Afghanistan, because I don't see anything further in Afghanistan to be destroyed. Uh, but at least for Pakistan, Iran, and other regional countries, that will be a very a nightmare situation. Because the, re- the, the reason is that um, at the moment, uh, Taliban are fighting, and uh, they are putting a very tough resistance against the international forces in Afghanistan for the last almost 15 years, uh, almost 18 years. Uh, and uh, and the, the Afghan troops, uh, there's uh, 300 and plus uh, national security, including the police and the national army. So they are they, they are also very train and they are committed to uh, to, to fight uh, definitely against the insurgent so i think that will be a very a very very a very precarious situation for the regional peace but the fact is that uh, the, there are too many uh, difficulties uh, you know that at the moment there is talks between the the, the us government and the Taliban, and it took almost a year, more than a year now. They are still talking, uh, and we don't know what what's going to happen in the next round of talks. Uh, and they they they, they couldn't uh, figure out uh, the, the the final uh, the final agreement uh, so far, and they are still unsuccessful. So now look at the situation when the Afghan Afghan uh, start talking. That is where the elephant lies in the room, because that is the most difficult situation. When the Afghan Afghan set together and they try to figure out. Uh, what will be the quality, what will be the system, <clears throat> sorry, how we will adjust each other, especially the Taliban or the other uh, the other fighting groups. So uh, first, uh, uh, God forbid, if U.S. withdraw from Afghanistan and, and, and the situation in Afghanistan, at least at the moment, it is constant. So that's, that, that is, I think, out of... Uh, the, the, Definitely, that will be a very difficult situation uh, for uh, not only for Afghanistan, for the region, for the region. But the most difficult thing will be, in, even if the U.S. is in a bit of hurry to withdraw from Afghanistan, and uh, they are not uh, the, the, the Afghan Afghans have not uh, not start, uh, started talking or either having an agreement. Again, I see uh, that the situation in Afghanistan is going to be very, a uh, very dangerous. Right, and you just mentioned that. The situation is going to be very, let's say, precarious if the U.S. leaves Afghanistan just like that. But the the countries that have been meeting yesterday, do you think that the regional countries can assist the Afghans in coming up with a political system, perhaps more comprehensive, doable, practicable uh, political system in Afghanistan? Can they assist? Of course, the Afghans have to do it themselves. Yeah, I I, I think that's possible only uh, if the U.S. is there... Uh, because at the moment it is the U.S. and the West, uh, they are financing uh, the, the, the government. So definitely I agree uh, that uh, when you say that once the U.S. withdrew, so definitely they will not go to finance the way they are doing it right now, because at the moment they have huge interest uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan. So definitely they want a peaceful, uh, they, they will be interested definitely in a peaceful uh, arrangement uh, in Afghanistan. In case the U.S. withdrew, so I think that will be, then too difficult for the regional countries to uh, uh, to figure out or uh, to have an arrangement uh, where there is a sustainable peace in Afghanistan. Because, you know, Pakistan is already in a position which is not that much accepted uh, to the Afghans, uh, different factions or groups, uh, including uh, uh, the, the former Mujahideen or including the former communist uh, leader or even the North, West, South, you know. So I think, uh, and, and, and the same is, the, the Iranian interests are uh, in collision, uh, uh, particularly with Pakistan, especially the economic interest and their, uh, their, their political interest in Afghanistan. So I think uh, only, you, uh, only Russia and China are there 
to 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 and 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 both the countries have not that much influence on the ground so definitely they have their pockets in kabul but right. as for the afghanistan is concerned so i i, I don't see that the regional countries will then succeed in case the us were drew and is just lock the door and catch the first bus on the road uh, and leave for washington so that will be a very uh, the, the the regional countries in a, will be in a very difficult position to figure out anything uh, we call peace in afghanistan Right, Mr. Hassan Khan. Thank you for joining us. Are you having on the show? Thank you very much, Mr. Zaki. All these points that Mr. Hassan Khan just mentioned, uh, the political landscape, the political situation at the moment in Afghanistan, the future of the political situation in Afghanistan. Over the years, do you think that Taliban too have changed? They have now tested what diplomacy is. You know, going to different countries. Uh, there are reports that they have been, you know, visiting China earlier. They would be visiting China once again. To, they have been to Moscow, meeting the Americans in, in Qatar, Doha, visiting Islamabad. So there is also a new generation within the Taliban who also want to open it, open, you know, uh, with the rest of the world. And people of Afghanistan also want change. So Afghan society generally has been going through some uh, changes and they have been moving on. Uh, given the historical background of Taliban <coughs> in Afghanistan, uh, Taliban is they always want one point that the foreign invention mm. in Afghanistan should have to leave the country. Right. That is the beginning of the mm. peace. Right. And they never changed their strategy since the first day. The question is that who accepted them? Yeah. Today, America accepted that they, they didn't successfully done what they go for they Afghanistan. Okay. They, they, they destroyed the uh, Taliban government, mm. but they didn't eliminate Talibans. Mm. They tried to eliminate it, but it takes almost now 18 years finish. Now the 19 years we enter for a few days. So now the, the question is that how many loss and cost, financial loss and human cost we have faced. 111,000 civilian and military Afghan and foreign armies lost their lives and 360 wounded right. over there. So now see the magnitude of the loss, plus the cost of American uh, and NATO allies right. put that war. It's still, Taliban is uh, significant, yeah. have significant power inside. They have Afghanistan. significant power. But so my, my what, question what, is, what, right. what, what they understand is that the rest of the world understand today that we cannot eliminate them by force. So at least there should have to be a diplomatic uh, we should have to try on diplomatic way. The Taliban, by themselves, they understand they cannot win this sort of war. Yeah. They cannot win this sort of war against the coalition yeah. or against the foreign. The loss will go, go back to the Afghan civilian. So now they understand, m uh, leaders, of Af leaders of Taliban, that we should have to open the door of the diplomacy to the rest of the world. Right. And uh, Mashur Khatak, uh, do you agree with this point that Taliban, they have also changed over the years? Or right. their, their, let's say, <coughs> modus operandi would change the right. way of their dealing with the Afghan to people? The, to the extent from attempting to have exclusive power, now they are willing to share the power. Very good. Mm -hmm. That's it. But more than that, not. The fact is the world has realized that if Talibs cannot be convinced, they cannot be eliminated either. Right. So, you know, in a situation like this, uh, some get convinced and some remain unconvinced, but the, everyone cannot be eliminated. The very fact that they have acquired international legitimacy and legit legitimacy from the U.S. is a huge diplomatic achievement. A diplomatic achievement which has actually shaken the very foundation of the government in Kabul. You know, that in a way the signal is that you are not the only one, you know, who are responsible for Afghanistan. Afghanistan has other groups and parties as well. And Taliban, the fact that they are in control of something like the majority of the territory, you know, uh, it's a kind of a situation that you had in 60s between the Viet Cong and the Americans, you know. Uh, 
with only difference that they had attacked offensive and this and that, which yes. was not taking place and all that. But the situation is quite similar, you know, that Marshal Kauki and, you know, earlier President Thieu of South Vietnam, they were not ready to talk to the Viet Cong. Yes. But eventually Americans realized, you see, that these gentlemen, you know, may be pro-Americans, but they cannot deliver. deliver right. So it's yeah. better to deal with the devil who delivers than with the angel which cannot deliver. deliver right. So, you know, it's a <clears throat> this is a statecraft, this is something, number one. Number two, that uh, the uh, when it comes to the comments of Mr. Hassan that Pakistan and other countries will have a nightmare and all that, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that we have been having a nightmare. Mm. For a long time. Afghans have been having a nightmare. nightmare right. And we have proved that we can survive nightmares. Mm. It's the dead dreams that we should stop having, you know. It's our kind of that mindset which thinks, you see, that uh, the U.S. from 8,000 miles can come and solve or unsolve this problem, you know, and something, you know. The countries of the region and Afghanistan will have to learn to, you know, structure their own peace which suits their own conditions. And here I may point out that Iran's inclusion is very much needed because <coughs> Iran shares borders, border with, border. With, border border. with Afghanistan and, and there's, a, there's a sizable population of Afghanistan which is pro-Iran, pro-Tehran. So, you know, it's... <coughs> It has to be a kind of a mix. Mm. It's not going to have, you see, uh, a clean solution for uh, everyone. Uh, everyone. Yeah, everyone. It has to be a mixed solution. There will be give and take. Some you would lose, some you will. And this is going off. to take time. Yeah. Win -win this will take time. Yeah. Because so let's hope that we, we have a peace in Afghanistan soon. We'll take a break. And after the break, we're going to discuss about the war in Syria, uh, as I said in my introduction. Both wars that we are talking about, Afghanistan and Syria, uh, these are not just two wars, one in Afghanistan and one in Syria. Within these two wars, there are many wars that are going on. We are going to discuss about that after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are discussing about the wars in Afghanistan and the war in Syria. Uh, we discussed Afghanistan before the break. And after the break now, we are going to discuss about Syria, uh, Russia and Turkey. They are going to collaborate to have uh, security for Turkey, of course, uh, as they call uh, their safe zone in the, the, their, with their border that they have with, with Syria. Uh, Daesh has been a concern for the region, Middle East, and uh, the uh, Syrian Democratic Force, the Kurds, has been a concern for the Turkish government and they want stability over there. We just saw whatever was there in the news. But the American policy towards Syria has too been very interesting, starting with President Obama who uh, criticized the Assad regime, uh, 
and giving a statement that uh, the protesters that were out there in Syria, they should be considered by the Assad regime. And once the operation started against the protesters, interestingly, the United States, uh, they, were, they, they washed on what was going over there. So the American policy regarding Syria has been pretty interesting. Uh, Mr. Uh, Zaki talking about Syria, the security situation over there. Turkey certainly ha they have their, their uh, concerns about Syria. If there is a void, clearly speaking, uh, somebody has to fill in. If let's say U.S. is pulling out of Syria or Afghanistan, Syria since we are talking about it, then somebody would have to uh, fill that void. Fill and also, uh, Turkey has uh, uh, concerns about their security. And Daesh over there, the Syrian Democratic Force, the Kurds, they have grievances with them. They have these differences. How do you see the whole situation? The situation in Syria, uh, since the civil war started, <coughs> it was a infight, infighting the different interest groups from the local to the regional to the global. So from the local, there are sectarian differences between the uh, Syrian civil, uh, civilians. Some of them are fighting for the for the Shia, Shia-led government, with the help of the uh, Iran back it, and also Hezbollah from Lebanon. Mm. So motivated by the idea of Shiism. The other side is that those who are fighting for the Sunni, uh, Sunni-motivated mm. ideology, which back it by Saudi Arabia. So here, that is the local uh, issue. When it came to the regional uh, perspective, mm. Iran and Saudi Arabia is also involved with, and Turkey to the other side of the border. Uh, everyone have different interests inside Syria. When it came to the global interests, now the Russia and America have a different interests inside Syria. America was supporting the Saudi ideology, uh, but all of them have one common enemy. All that. Uh, different interest groups, they have one common enemy. It's ISIS or Daesh. Right. And Daesh get the chance because of their differences, they grow up very fast. Mm. And when they, everyone involved the war, they lose a lot of land. And now the question is that if Americans are going to withdraw, with the, they were helping already uh, Kurdish fighters. Mm. Mm. And Kurdish is the only nation who don't have independent state in the region. Right. They are divided into four different countries, right. Syria, mm -hmm. Iraq, Turkey, and a small number group in Iran. Iran right. So here is the case. They were always demanding an independent country. If they cannot get independent country, mm -hmm. they, they, they want autonomous region inside Turkey. Right. But Turkey never accepted that. Whether it's the previous regime of Turkey right. uh, under the dictatorship mm -hmm. or whether it is the uh, democratic system now uh, led by Erdogan. Right. So both of them <coughs> didn't accept the Kurdish as an autonomous or independent state. So that's for the Kurdish state. But the bigger question is, what is the American, Ameri American withdrawal? American what, policy. What is the American policy for Middle East, Ambassador Khattar? Well, specific talking about Syria. Specific, I'll go for specific examples. Our, our Arab friends should have known one thing. Americans are not going to spill their blood for Arabs. No. Obama, <coughs> as you rightly mentioned, that the uprising supported the uprising. It was seen as a part of the uh, Arab Spring. Yes. When the military crackdown came, you know, then he drew a deadline of uh, this uh, chemical weapons. That red line was yes, crossed. crossed yes. And then he did, could not do anything. He was bailed out by Foreign Minister Lavrov of Russia. You know, uh, it was a kind of a face saving, which the Russians invited to him. Uh, then Turkey was supporting these girls, you know, and this, uh, regardless of the fact that this, uh, this. Uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, PKK was, uh, was uh, declared as a terrorist, terrorist organization. organization by the U.S. because of its affiliation with the uh, during the Cold War with the East German secret police and with the Soviet secret police and etc. etc. 
Uh, for them to defend, de depend that heavily on the American support was a mistake, number one. So it was a, something which has to be sort of, uh, you know, seen in its proper context. It should have been foreseen. Number two, you know, it is not in Israeli interest that the issue in Syria should get settled in one way or the other. The greater turmoil it is, the better it is for Israel. Thanks to this turmoil, Israel was able to uh, annex Golan Heights. And now it is talking of uh, 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 Jordan, uh, this uh, valley also, yes. you know. Right. Right. Uh, so in the Israeli interest, a turmoil in Syria is very much in its interest, and Israelis in that are backed by the Americans. So in this situation, the Americans decided to withdraw, and rather suddenly, and a power vacuum was created. Uh, for Turkey, it was very important, you see, to fill this power vacuum because this is a not just Kurdish area, but also it is inhabited by the Turkmen, the Turkmen who are the left over of the Ottoman Empire days. And mind, like Russia, Turkey also has a kind of a concept of near abroad. Like Russia has a concept of near abroad that where Russian nationalities come under attack, you see, of uh, the, right. the local majorities, then it is their moral and political responsibility, you see, to defend them. Yes. Similarly, Turkey also has it. And this is, I think, the philosophic or the, if not the ideological basis of this understanding between Turkey and Russia. Now here the most important factor is of the joint monitoring of this border. This joint monitoring basically would mean, you see, that the Kurds would leave without much of a bloodshed. I personally think that uh, President Erdogan, uh, with his uh, faith orientation, yeah. is not for Muslim shedding blood of Muslims. And this may have factored in, in his view, mm -hmm. that the joint patrolling with Russia uh, would, number one, uh, minimize the blood shedding. Number two, any possibility of a clash between Syrian forces and Turkish forces would be precluded because of the Russian. Another presence. view. The third party. Mr. Mm -hmm. Zaki, do you see it that way? Because this, this philosophical approach that says very interesting that what Russians and Turkish think about, mm -hmm. you know, their domains and their areas and their duty towards the, their, their uh, I would say, their uh, fellow men. There is, there is one, one more point I want to add, uh, the point of ambassador, that <coughs> Turkey understand that uh, if they go for Turkish invention and occupy the land of Kurdish, that will trigger out more anger in the BKK, the, those who are living inside Turkey. Right. So in order to save the blood of, the, of that Kurdish, mm -hmm. uh, they should have, they cannot also replace with uh, Arab uh, Syrian Arab armies to control the land of the Kurdish in Syria. There's also another issue. So here, there should have to be a trust between Kurdish and Turkish. Mm. Where that's the place Russia is going to fill. Russia, given the, uh, given the guarantee that Kurdish will not attack the mainland of, Kur uh, of Turkey, and Turkey, uh, Turkish will not, uh, will not attack the Kurdish. They will peacefully withdraw their okay, armies, right. yes. and their land will be safe with the, with the combined patrol of the border area. And that is also saving the Erdogan's popularity inside Turkey, because Erdogan's popularity is going down right. for the last couple of years, mm -hmm. because, because due to their going to the authoritarian uh, rule.
but still he's a popular leader, not only in Turkey, but also in Muslim world and Arab world. He's more, more respected. Right. So in that sense, he, if he avoid any sort of blood, blood in Kurdish, that will give them a positive you have feedback. A point? I'm yes. A yes. Um, I think he's right, but if the Kurds have to choose between Arab hmm. rule and Turkish rule, okay. it will be a choice between the hard but rock and the hard sea. That's very good. I think, I, I think that uh, basically, you know, uh, Kurds, you know, should, and for that matter, other separatist elements in the post colonial states should also learn mm -hmm. that the foreign sponsors, you see, all the foreign supported separatist movements can fall on their face and, and can land up in a bad, bad right. situation. Right. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Karak, are you having on the show? Mr. Zaki, thank you for your time. Thank are you, you having on the show? Thank you for having me. That's all from today's dialogue. See you next time. Khuda Hafiz.